Okay, and we are rolling. What are the exact steps you would take to rebuild the gut microbiome of someone who has taken antibiotics? The issue of antibiotics is, is a huge topic. Because um, of my work in diabetes, we know that uh, the research shows that if people have had uh, five treatments of diabetes, of antibiotics over a period of 15 years, they, uh, they increase their rate of getting diabetes by 50%. So first thing I'm going to look at is, do we have any blood sugar imbalances? Do we have any diabetes? And looking at the bigger picture. So that's one thing that has to be taken care of. The second part of that picture is uh, if there is a issue with blood sugar, then I'm going to also want to check for candida. So once those two things are appropriately focused on, then we have ways to treat candida with a, a low glycemic diet, uh, what I call phase one diet, which is uh, vegetables, nuts, seeds, uh, and, and the full range of vegetables um, as a key low glycemic diet to heal the candida, and then some enzymes that also make a difference. Then we also, at the same time, address rebuilding the gut microflora. And there's two levels of rebuilding. Um, the first level is also prebiotic. So there's certain foods uh, like radishes uh, that literally stimulate your natural prebiotic, like what you were born with. Okay, uh, broccoli is another food that seems to stimulate the growth of your own prebiotics, which is pretty important. Then in addition, uh, I have a variety of probiotics that I give people to rebuild. Uh, now, the other part of it is often the bowel function is thrown off. So I don't use cathartics, but I use an herb called triphala, or Ayurvedic herb, that is very good for reestablishing the natural uh, bowel muscle movement. So we're getting, a, according to your constitution, at least one bowel movement a day, but if you're what we call pitta, three bowel movements a day. So we want to reestablish normal bowel motility. We want to build up the prebiotics with the different foods and the probiotics. I also will, um, strongly recommend sauerkraut or kimchi, which are natural ways to, to build that up. But I also will use, when we have a disruption, um, a variety of acidophiluses, mixes, according to what people t test for. So that, that's a, like a whole big picture. But I include, wow, we really do need to check for candida. We do need to check if they really actually thrown off their system enough that they, they have hypoglycemia or diabetes. So I kind of look at that whole picture. And uh, we have to get the blood sugar at least less than 100 here uh, because that all is going to disrupt the overall function. And it's harder to heal. And, of course, blood sugar being higher will also stimulate diabetes, uh, candida. Does your blood sugar need to be below 85 to be healthy? The optimal blood sugar is 70 to 85. Fasting blood sugar in the morning before you've eaten anything. I don't really like it. Uh, uh, it so that's optimal. That's okay. Less than 100 is passable. Between 100 and 125, fasting blood sugar, is what we consider prediabetes. I don't make a diagnosis just in the fasting blood sugar. I look at fasting leptin, fasting insulin, uh, A1C. These are measures of that we see when we're considering diabetes and, and so forth. So I look at that whole picture. Optum, though, is 70 to 85.
Tell us about the type 2 diabetes studies that you personally conducted and what the results were. So I began working uh, with diabetes really in the 70s uh, for different reasons and also hypoglycemia because I was aware of the connection between blood sugar variations and brain function and also uh, energetic field of protection because what I saw is that when your blood sugar is out of balance, particularly when it's low, you can have depression and anxiety uh, and paranoia. There's a variety of things. So we really have to give it attention. Um, I, in that context, I worked with healing uh, type 2 diabetes and uh, hypoglycemia and naturally. I think my first kind of reference was uh, in Dr. Pavel Arola's book, uh, A Better Approach to Hypoglycemia. And some of the things from the 70s were in that. I didn't actively pursue in a larger scale until 2007 looking at treating uh, diabetes. And it, it wasn't the direct intention. I was looking at the effects of live food and putting people on just a, a fasting and live food program. And I began to see, wow, we're having a really big effect on type 2 diabetes. So in around 2007, I began to explore that with groups and ultimately I've written uh, two editions uh, there is a cure for diabetes. Now, that's a very radical thing. What do I mean? Because what I learned at medical school, at Columbia Medical School, but all medical schools, there's no cure for diabetes. Oh, well, that's interesting. It's a steady downhill path to an early death between 10 and 19 years earlier. So it's pretty heretical to say, oh, there's a cure for diabetes, when you're told it's incurable. And that's just not type 1, it's also type 2. So what I got is uh, an official study of, uh, of about 120 people, is that for people who were type 2 non-insulin dependent, 61% uh, healed in three weeks. The heal means a steady blood sugar under 100. Okay? And then 100% were off all medications. So that's an important part of the story. The second group were what I call the insulin dependent diabetics. And in three weeks, 24% healed and 96% came off all medications for their diabetes. So that's a pretty good uh, statement. Now, going beyond three weeks, what happened to people? Well, over a year, a much higher percentage healed. I didn't have the finances to track everybody, but when people really stayed on the diet and the approach uh, and the herbs that I used, we got a much, much higher percentage. So three weeks is very fast when you're told you can't heal it, it's a downward path of death. It's like, oh, and we're reversing it in three weeks at a very high percentage. Now, surprising to me, because in my mind, I also saw that type, I thought that type ones really, you couldn't have an effect, but somehow some type ones got into the study. And I say somehow because it wasn't clear. And I was shocked to find that in three weeks, 21% of the type ones healed. And that was shocking to me, because that was not my ex expectation. And about 31% of the people were uh, pretty controlled blood sugar, uh, less than 126, with no medication. So 21% of the type 1s were off all insulin. They began producing insulin, that's a whole story, but as the pancreas got healthier, they began producing insulin. and actually 
their fasting insulin went up, which is how they got off the insulin. And so that was very, very exciting. So I kind of see two ranges now. It's trickier with type one, to be honest. And right now in my work where I um, have programs in uh, outside of Sao Paulo, Brazil, and in Israel, as well as in Patagonia, Arizona, which is my U.S. home base, um, I'm really just seeing type twos now because type ones take more attention. Uh, there's other things going on that can get out of control. I mean, I've literally had a person who's kind of taken our type one who's fast with me three or four times, and then suddenly, why we're fasting, she goes into some degree of crisis, like four times, and she sure me no problem with it. So, I really just work with type twos because I don't, because I'm traveling all over the world. I mean, I've literally spoken in 42 different countries. It's it's a lot. I've seen people from over 128 different countries. Uh, for me to be responsible, I'm, I feel very safe with type twos. Now, what also happens is that type twos who are on insulin, when we take them through fasting, they have to be really followed. This is really important, okay? Because within a week, usually I get them off their insulin, three days to a week. But I'm meeting with them several times a day. We're paying attention. This, this isn't something you just do haphazardly. So we pay real attention. We slowly, slowly take them off. Slow, let's fast. And, you know, in pretty much in one week, most everybody's off. Sometimes it goes to two weeks. Along with that, we see people who with high blood pressure come to normal uh, in, again, a week to two weeks. So there's a lot of things that happen in this whole process. Um, I had a, a very interesting lady who was 95 years old who uh, came. She had type 2 diabetes. She came in a wheelchair because she had severe arthritis, and she was on 13 different heart medications. So she took the program, and after three weeks, she was out of her wheelchair. Arthritis is reversed. She no longer had diabetes. She was less than 100 in her blood sugar, and she was off all 13 heart medications. Oh, wow, that's uh, amazing at 95. So there's a, a story. To, uh, there's a message to that. I saw her a year later, and she was great walking around. I saw her in New York City. What is the message? At any age, you can heal. You are not too old to heal at any age, at least for diabetes, but we're also looking at high blood pressure, which she had. Um, so it's a really important message for people to get. Yeah, when we're talking at that level, we do need some management, but we are not too old to heal at any age. Very important message. People uh, really kind of give up on themselves with age, oh, well, it's just a problem with age. No, you're not too old to heal. Now, when I see this, I've also been tracking a variety of things. Most people come in and they already have peripheral neuropathy. And I, I in my exam, because I do exam, I listen to the heart, take the blood pressure, but I also uh, do a neurological exam. And I see at the end of the three-week program, uh, many of the neurop neuropathies go away. I've also had a person who was legally blind, and uh, after three months on the program, he was no longer legally blind. So I am saying something really important. At any age, and almost anything can be reversed. So obviously, uh, well, with uh, type 2 and type 1 diabetes, 85% of the people get some level of retinopathy, okay? And his case was pretty severe. That reversed. And I've seen that with other people, too. Um, people also, 70% have uh, neur neuropathies, what we're talking about, and about 40% of the people have uh, kidney 
decreasing kidney function. And unfortunately, most the biggest cause of death from diabetes is heart attack. So we see a return of heart function and vision and nervous system function. And the most important, which isn't tracked that much in the literature, is return of memory. So people come in and uh, 10 being optimal, they may be a two or three. And literally, after three weeks, they may get to eight or nine. And it was very exciting. As, as a psychiatrist, besides a holistic physician, I'm looking at, the, you know, how's your memory? How's your cognition? So I, I have people rate that before we start. So I am saying it's very exciting to me to see people return their cognition and their memory. I mean, that's a big deal in people's lives to have your brain. And that's one of the big things that are hit. I mean, I can, you can pick it up pretty quickly if you're, you know, a train. I mean, I remember we're looking at buying a car. It's like the car salesman. I said, do you have diabetes? Because I could tell his thinking was impaired. The point I'm making, and he did, but the point I'm making is you you can see it, and you can see the improvement. And for someone like me, um, who values the mind, not that everybody does, but a lot of people do. It's like that's a big deal. So uh, returning of memory, and cognition, and clarity of mind, very 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 important thing. And I see that on my program, and even as soon as three weeks. So those are the kinds of things I see. It's like, wow, this is really exciting. I mean, I really like this because I see people come back to life. Now, another thing is sexual function. And once people have diabetes, somewhere between 10 and 15 years, particularly the men, uh, the circulation is impaired, so their ability uh, to perform sexually is also impaired. Again, circulation improves. And their sexual function improves too. So we have mind, and we have uh, general health, and we have nervous system, peripheral neuropathy, we have vision, and we also have sexual function coming back. So it's really pretty exciting, and just the idea that you can reverse it, and in many cases cure it as soon as three weeks, is a huge message. And again, at any age, we're never too too old to heal. So the whole thing excites me. I just love seeing people come back to life. I mean, I that makes it really worthwhile to see, to see that. And these are good results. And again, over time, if people stay on it, like the person who was legally blind after three months getting his vision back, that's pretty pretty exciting. How do you cure? Migraine headaches. Migraine headaches are uh, have many, many, many causes, and so the biggest thing is looking at the cause. Is it is it an allergy? Is it that your blood vessels expand under certain conditions and put pressure on on the the nerves that surround the blood vessel? So. We kind of have to see what's the cause. Again, allergies are a very, very common cause. So that's a holistic approach. What's the cause? What's going on? Is it emotional? Is it this? I use a lot of homeopathy in my work for migraine headaches. I would say probably a 95% success rate, but it's there's not like there's one approach. Okay, yeah, we got to clear the blood sugar. Yeah, we have to do certain things. But I, I find homeopathy uh, being a really uh, very effective for that. In that way, but we have to get people healthy as well. Do complex carbohydrates turn into sugar? And if they do, then what's different between eating them versus fruit? There, there's several points to that. Again, I'm going to talk about it from a diabetes point of view. Uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about cancer, but I don't do a lot of work with cancer. I, I refer my uh, people who are focused on cancer to 
or Brian Clements at Hippocrates, because that's, that's not my level of expertise. My goal is to get people optimally healthy, uh, life mastery for them, working on their blood sugar and all the other things that go on. So at the level of cancer, I'll leave her out. That being said, first thing we have to understand is, is that cancer cells love glucose 10 times more than regular cells. And cancer cells love fructose 10 times more than they love glucose. So it's, uh, I want to minimize fructose in the diet. Fructose also is one of the leading causes of uh, liver disease. Okay, so we want to minimize fructose in that way. So, so one of the big differences, fructose versus glucose that you, you have in, in, in grains and things like that. Um, I looked at the literature trying to figure out the food issue, and I found eight studies. Now, maybe now there's more studies. And there's only three fruits that don't seem to raise the blood sugar or disorder, and that's bilberries, blueberries, which are terrific, and green apples. So those are the only fruits I okay for people after they have a blood sugar less than 100 for three months and then off the medication of the herbs for three months, that's six months, then they're okay to have those, those three fruits. So that's a, a concern for me in terms of the bigger picture. Uh, now, the question is slow acting versus fast acting and fructose versus glucose. So the research shows that if your blood sugar is greater than 110 for a few hours, uh, you start to get the destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas. So what are they? That's what makes insulin. At 100, the beta cells get weakened, but at 110, they start to be destroyed. So a slow acting starch versus you know, uh, a, a, a simple carbohydrate is safer because you get more of a, with a simple carbohydrate, you get a spike, and with selecting, you get more like that. So that is uh, preferable to me as having slow active. Now, what I have found long term, first of all, people are unique. We're unique individuals. We have over 20,000 to 30,000 gene variations. Uh, and, well, 20 to 30,000 genes on up to uh, 200,000 gene variations. That's roughly because it's a new field, new, relatively speaking. So, there is a variation in the diet. And what it, uh, other research has shown is that 70% of the people need a slightly higher protein, 30% need a slightly lower protein. So, although it's common among some vegans to say it should be high complex carbohydrate, low fat, and low protein diet, in reality, it depends on your constitution, or eventually, and if you're what we call fast slow oxidized, these are measurable things. And so there's a great variability. So I'm a person that can have a, a slightly higher carbohydrate diet. Now on chromosome 19, it pretty much lays out your ratio. How your person needs more protein, less protein, more carbohydrate, less carbohydrate, more fat, Less fat. And I'm, I'm going to say animal fat, uh, plant fat in that basis. So the whole complexity is what we have to look at. And so I try to organize somebody's diet according to that. Generally, once you're healed, I mentioned those three fruits, that's good. I don't go with a lot of starchy uh, foods. I'm really looking at. Uh, 
is a basic diet, nuts, seeds, avocados, olives, uh, that kind of thing, and lots of leafy greens, lots and lots and lots of sprouts. And that's your optimum diet, and it's your optimum healing diet. Now, once you're stabilized, because not everybody can really do, I break it into therapeutic and maintenance. That's a therapeutic diet. I call it phase one. And then some of us, like myself, are pretty much on what I call 1.25. What does it mean? So um, I don't really do a grains, but uh, 1.25 will have blueberries in it and things like that. Uh, I, that's my main food that I have because it's a super optimal thing. If I could find bilberries around, I probably would do that too. That's very good for your vision as well. So just kind of perspective. So, and our protein needs change with time too. So we, we have to kind of be aware that we're a moving target. What do you need be, before puberty? What do you need from puberty to maybe 65? Uh, for example, i take myself as an example because uh, I experimented myself. Okay? Um, uh, I'm a person that doesn't eat very much, as I say, uh, very much protein. So uh, I was probably getting 8% protein. And at 65, I kind of looked and I saw in the literature, wait, wait, with age, you need more protein. Between age 45 to 65, really excess protein, and I'll explain what that is in a second, uh, you double your rate of mortality and quadruple your rate of cancer. Well, that's not really a winner. But honestly, I was doing it because I was just trying to get the optimum for me. And kind of looking as an athlete for in the story. Um, so at the age of 65, I'm noticing you need maybe a little bit more protein. I, uh, I was doing 25 pull-ups, okay? I was stuck. I wasn't progressing. Okay, let's add a little bit more protein. And I added a tablespoon of E3 Live a day. Well, I went from 25 up to 100 pull-ups at one time. That's a lot for most people. When I was captain of an undefeated football team, I could do seven, okay? Uh, so I saw that actually by just increasing my protein to maybe 10 or 12%, I dramatically improved my physical strength. That's an you know, important message here is a little adjustment. So what I see is depending on the person, and uh, we call it the M, uh, mTOR pathway, um, which is a pathway for anti-cancer and longevity, is we need between 35 and 70 grams a day. Most people are getting too much protein. So higher protein in my world is 70 grams, unless you're pregnant, and 35 grams is lower protein. So maybe I'm getting 50 grams. Okay. That's optimizing. I'm a person that needs closer to the 10% versus the 15% of protein as calories. Then fat is somewhere between 25 and 45%. And that's plant-based fat. And plant-based fat is really different than animal uh, fat in a variety of ways, as is plant-based protein. Okay, the, the, that's actually really important to understand. So, uh, and then I have 25 to 35% carbohydrate, which are mostly leafy green sprouts and so forth. So that's my ratio. Now, other people, we can go 25 to 45% of carbohydrate, 25 to 45% of plant-based fat, and 10 to 15%. So there is a variation, and it varies with age. That's my point I'm making here, is that, wow, you get older, you need a little bit more protein. That's interesting, and that's good for you, whereas between the ages of 45 and 60, right? Not so good. You want to be lower. So those are kind of considerations. Now, because we're moving target, because we're evolving in different ways, with, we're changing with age, uh, we also know that basically 
10 to 15 percent of the population from age 20 to 65 has type 2 diabetes. I mean, we are looking at an epidemic of diabetes. I'm not really addressing that as I'm explaining it. That's it. And after age of 65, we're up to 27 percent of uh, the population in the U.S. with type 2 diabetes. What happens? So what's happening is there is an enzyme, uh, uh, G6 uh, phosphatase, which tends to take glycogen, which is stored, uh, in a sense, glucose, break it down faster. And it also tends to take protein and turn it into sugar, which is a subtle point because too much protein for a diabetic can also be a problem because it gets broken down to sugar. So after the age of 65, that enzyme increases in its production in our liver, and we're creating more glucose. Our diet stays the same, we're still, but we're creating more glucose, and that's why we have 27% of the population having diabetes after the age of 65. So we have to pay more attention with age. I think it's really important for people to understand we're, we're, we're not cows. We are unique individuals. We're going to have different diets, and we don't just eat grass. But it also varies with age. And we have to understand it's a moving picture. It varies with age. It varies with constitution. So there's not one diet for everybody. There's not one supplement program for everybody. We need to see the uniqueness. Okay, and, and that's really kind of what I'm saying. Uh, but on my own experimentation, just adding a little bit, I'm making the point, a little bit of protein, one tablespoon more. And suddenly, I'm able to do 100 pull-ups pull a few times a week. So that's a message to me, but it was like, okay, this is real. How do you protect yourself from the radiation from the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident? Is it safe to visit Japan? That's a political question. Um, I'm not going on my way to visit Japan. Uh, radiation stays around for a long time, not for a week or a year, but for years. Uh, all the fish in the Pacific Ocean has been tested for radiation, and pretty much all the fish that they're catching is highly radiated. Unfortunately, the sea vegetables, kelp, nori, and so forth, from the Pacific are also found to be very high in radiation. So that's a big deal. Uh, that's one level. If we look at the another level, big picture, radiation creates free radicals. And so we want to have more antioxidants in our system. And, you know, so that's another piece. And the third piece, which is really happening inside the mitochondria, inside the nucleus of the cell, is that there's a lot more free radicals. And so I use a particular homeopathic radiation neutralization that specifically uh, rebalances the nucleus of the cell to, to undo the free radicals. And so that's something I take. Most people need it's 12 drops a day three bottles worth uh, if you're living in japan it's the, i usually see five bottles so you do five bottles worth and pretty much clears it so we can uh, protect ourselves against that nuclear radiation another thing we need to do is eat lower on the food chain why is that well the research shows that 95 to 96 percent of the pesticides and herbicides and really radiation is higher up in the food chain, meaning animal uh, tissue. And so, okay, that's clear. So eat lower in the food chain. So by being vegan and live food vegan, we're minimizing that. Now, we also did research at the Tree of Life with Greenhouse. <coughs> and the greenhouse, we found uh, it was up to five times lower radiation because we're, we, I, I have a, a lab that analyzes radiation. <clears throat> so being protected from the air minimizes the radiation exposure. 
So we look at Rad Newt, we look at uh, the different levels of eating lower in the food chain, we look at increasing the amount of antioxidants that neutralize the radiation, uh, clearly not having fish, but I hate to say it, but even the sea vegetables, kelp, nori, and so forth from the Pacific, I don't do. We try to get it from like Maine Coast sea vegetables, the Atlantic Ocean. So those are some of the things we do uh, in general that everybody can do. Is it important to take green vegetable or sprout juice each day? Uh, what about wheatgrass? And can't you just eat lots of greens instead of juicing? Well, you can. Okay. And at the other level, uh, one or two green juices a day is very concentrated and very good for cleansing and rejuvenating. Uh, now, I also found, this is the wheatgrass we are growing, which is very rich, that actually raises your blood sugar. So actually, in the immediate healing time in the three-week program, I recommend people don't take wheatgrass because it's so rich. And it's often very sweet, at least what we're growing is very sweet, which has to do with soil preparation. So, but the, the green juices are very potent cleansers, and they have lots of energy in them. So I do recommend one or two glasses a day of that. How effective are chemo and radiation? Uh, when should they be used, and when should something else be used instead? Well, I'm very hesitant to make too much of a comment because, again, I refer them all to Hippocrates. But generally in the literature, what I see is it may be 5 to 10% effective in general. Some, uh, some things like for leukemias, uh, Hodgkin's disease, uh, you may get a, a higher percentage of success with chemotherapy. Those are the, the big ones, 40 50%. Um, so that's one level. The downside is they tend to really undermine the immune system. So it's relative. Uh, leukemias, Hodgkin's disease, the good news is they're also very, very healable by natural approaches, which doesn't damage your immune system in the process. So I'm always going to go for that natural way. I'm not, I say, an expert in it, but chemotherapy for many pro uh, problems is 5 to 10% effective. And we're saying for five years, but once you've done that, you, you affect the body negatively in another way. So at <clears throat> a certain level, it may even make you more prone to cancer somewhere else. So I generally don't recommend chemotherapy you know, or radiation because of all the other problems that are associated with it. Uh, but again, I refer them to back. What health tests do you recommend for men over 40, over 50, over 60, or over 70? It, it's good to get a general screening. I think it's very important to check your fasting blood sugar, your A1C, because again, they're going to increase with age. Uh, those would be one. I, I think it's good to monitor your human growth hormone levels. It's good to get the general lab screening of the electrolytes and uh, your liver function tests, your kidney function tests, because you, you don't always know what's going on. So like once a year, if people can do that, that's really good. PSA for prostate, uh, there's a question about the accuracy. Well, the truth is lab tests, blood tests are about 85% accurate and not 100%. People kind of overrate it. And, uh, but still definitely worth doing like once a year to kind of look at the, the bigger picture. There are some tests like we call cancer profiles where you can actually check certain aspects of uh, certain tests which will be suggestive of cancer if there's a whole pattern. 
So it's good to look at that too. So generally, uh, that's what's good to do. And if you have questions, then you want to be more specific. Uh, cholesterol is an interesting thing. There's a little bit of cholesterol paranoia. I surveyed the research and I put it out in my book, uh, There's a Cure for Diabetes, my last edition of it. And generally, people have a total cholesterol between 160 and 260 don't have an increase in heart disease. That's important to understand. Women with a cholesterol of 270 live 28% longer compared to women with a cholesterol of 193. So there's important things to understand. We know that cholesterol helps your brain function. And go the other way. A low cholesterol... If you're in the 25 percentile, you're going to double your rate of suicide. I actually learned that at Columbia Medical School, kind of incidentally, they were talking about it. And if you're very low in cholesterol, you're going to have up to six times higher suicide rate. So I consider the big issue is low cholesterol. If uh, people are below 160, I'm going to be a little concerned. Uh, and I will give them coconut oil uh, to raise their cholesterol to at least 160. Be, uh, cholesterol is actually a hormone, uh, the master uh, builder of hormones. So you need it for proper mental function, as I just mentioned, accidents, uh, suicide, neurological difficulties, and depression are all activated with a low cholesterol. So we, instead of worrying about cholesterol going too high, we should worry about going too low. Now, people have familiar hypercholesterol disease, like your cholesterol is over 300. That's an issue. We have to do things to bring it down. But take that out of the picture. Uh, the research really shows 160 to 260 for both men and women is, not, is uh, no difference in heart disease, which is obviously a big concern. Uh, but, but I'm going to go another way with it. Uh, they did a study in uh, people with their 89 years old and up. And why they picked that? Because we're looking at a particular thing, which is mortality. And they find that people who on average are 39 points high of cholesterol have 15% less mortality. That's pretty important. The research also shows people with higher cholesterol, again, within this range 160 to 260, have better cognition and better memory. So uh, we don't want to be paranoid about cholesterol uh, and not think so only one disease uh, because you can go low cholesterol, low fat diet as a healing diet, healing, not ongoing, you know, for heart disease and so forth. But I'm talking long term, uh, we want a certain level of cholesterol and it does impact longevity as well as cognition and a tendency for accident, as well as protects against uh, depression. And uh, so those are some of the key things that you want to keep in mind. Statins, from a diabetes point of view, are a problem because depending on the research, we're looking at somewhere between 40 and 80% increase in incidence of type 2 diabetes on people taking statins. Other research shows 12%. Well, it doesn't matter whether it's 12 or 40 to 80, it's increasing the incidence of diabetes. And from my point of view, that's a bigger uh, question. Professor Thomas Seyfried of Boston College said, cancer's fuel is glucose and glutamine. How can you starve your body of both of these? Well, the idea is not to go extreme. The diet I just talked about, phase 1.25 or 1.5, which is nuts and seeds, has fat in it. Remember, low, I'm sorry, a low omega 3s, they've also found a higher rate of suicide. So we have to have your long chain omega 3s, DHA and EPA, in this bigger picture. So a phase 1.5, 1.25, 1.5, you have your leafy greens, you have your nuts and seeds, and you 
can have a little bit of cooked food, also 100% vegan, 80% uh, live food as a minimum, you don't really have to worry about that. The rates of cancer are dramatically lower for people who are vegan. So uh, meat eaters tend to have 2.6 times more, 3.6 times more cancer than the prostate. They have increased, in general, increased rates of cancer somewhere between two and four fold in many of the areas of uh, cancer of the bowel, for example. So going vegan, keeping at 80% minimum live food, you're naturally going to be protecting yourself. And then I watch the blood sugar, particularly it increases with age. We may have to kind of modify the diet to do that. And you can have um, yams, yeah, sweet potatoes, beans, cooked beans. I'm not recommending much grain. Uh, the Chinese Taoist called said bigu. This is 450 BC. They got this figured out. Bigo means no grains. Uh, if you really need to have grains, you want to do the non-gluten and gliadin grains. Millet, buckwheat, quinoa, amaranth, and uh, Teff and rice is kind of in between in that story. Uh, so that minimizes it significantly. The other thing is you know, meat eaters have four times more osteoporosis. So we want to, you know, vegans have really significantly less women, vegan women and vegan men have significantly less osteoporosis. But it's still good to do anti-gravity exercises, jumping in the rebounder, things like that. So all those, I'm going to say, being healthy, we stop worrying about this sub, this thing or that thing because the diet and the lifestyle includes uh, nullifies that tendency. Do we need iodine as a nutritional supplement? How important is it and where do you get it? Iodine is extremely important uh, in a few areas. Uh, first of all, women who, pregnant women who, who are deficient in iodine, their children have a 13 point on the average lower IQ. They did a study in Indonesia where they gave kids iodine, and after four months, their IQ went up three, uh, eight points. So what am I saying? Obviously, it's affecting brain function. Obviously, it's, uh, let's say, we're looking at a brain, but also areas where iodine is very important, I'm not mentioning thyroid yet, okay, is heart. Heart function is very important. I find it's very important for optimal pancreas function. Uh, it's uh, the high, organ with the highest amount of iodine actually is the skin. We also know iodine is very good to support the immune system. So we have heart, we have pancreas, obviously we have thyroid. Um, we, we have brain function. So iodine is very good for improving the function of all these areas. Again, not just thyroid, that's a key concept. Uh, iodine is also very good as the best antimicrobial, antiviral there is, and also antifungal. We've known that since <clears> the <throat> 1850s. So it really protects you on, on that level. So these are just a little bit of understanding that what we're talking about is like it's incredibly important. I use a uh, particular iodine, uh, I call Illumidine, that's the name of it, Illumidine. And what that is, is it's I2 is broken into I minus. Very well absorbed and very potent. And I use iodine that is physically mined, I'm not sure exactly, in somewhere in South America. And so it's really, really pure because from the ocean, it's a little bit contaminated. So uh, from Chile. It's a, okay. So I recommend it for everyone. 
on all those levels. And one of the remarkable things, which is still a big deal in the world, is malaria. So around 1917, 18, a person in India was a very famous person was really having trouble with malaria, and it was about to kill him. And um, they started giving him iodine, this I minus form, and he healed. Now, I have programs in Africa, and even today, people are literally dying of, of malaria. Now, it's a little expensive, but to me, the best possible thing we could do for people is increase uh, their, the availability of iodine. So it also has to do with, uh, as I mentioned, IQ. So in iodine-deficient areas, we have lower IQ, significantly lower IQ. So it's good for everybody. They used to put it in the food to a certain extent, and they stopped doing it. And uh, I, I won't even speculate why they stopped doing it since it's so healthy for people. Research in the early 1900s really showed that young girls with little thyroid difficulty uh, really did much better with iodine. The other research that I think is really important is fibrocystic breast and breast cancer. And in Japan, research has shown that the iodine helps protect you against breast cancer, helps for breast cysts, fibrocystic breast disease, and actually making a difference. So it's actually a treatment as well, particularly for a variety of breast diseases. It's also good for ovarian uh, cysts, things like that. So we have a full range. The ovaries are made much better with proper iodine. So we have to think about it as a, as a, as a um, total nutrient, most of the population is really low in iodine. It's less in the soil, less in the food. And so it is a very essential nutrient. Now, there's another level, uh, which is called mitochondria. Mitochondria are the energy factories of the cell. And with all the toxins in the world, all the free radicals that are going on, many people are having serious mitochondrial uh, destruction. Now let's see what that, what do I mean? Roughly speaking, when I look at the literature, the average neuron needs about 5,000 mitochondria, heart needs 3,500 mitochondria, heart cells. Okay, that's interesting. So what I find is that some people come and they're very, very exhausted, they're having chronic fatigue and so forth, and as I check it out, they're very low in mitochondria. So iodine helps stimulate the production of mitochondria. And it's one of three things I use. Uh, I also use CoQ10PQQ and uh, D-ribose to build up the mitochondria, and it really does make a difference. So I'm seeing a, a variety of people like fatigued and weak, and I think from all the free radical type exposure that's going on in our society, the chemtrails, just on and on. And that's, uh, iodine is one of the main stimulators of, of uh, mitochondrial growth, which is really, really important. And one other thing that iodine does is it helps with apoptosis, which is the killing of uh, destroying dead and dying cells and also cancer cells. So it's, it helps our body to have the ability to weed out these things, you know, and destroy them, particularly cancer cells. So it's a general preventative against cancer. So we're talking that, we're talking immune system, we're talking heart, brain, that's pretty important, and pancreas, and thyroid, and skin, and as an antiparasitic. Uh, so I recommend people take iodine, the I minus. We use luminin as something every day to maintain and build up. It also forces out fluoride out of the pineal gland. Why is that important? Because we're st one of the few countries still putting fluoride in the water, and it accumulates in the pineal gland and kind of blocks that function. So what iodine will do 
the aluminate in specific, it's going to force the fluoride out of the pineal and replace it with iodine. And it forces the bromide out of the system and also forces out lead, mercury, and cadmium. So I always tell people to start slowly with this because, uh, you know, you could have a major detox. So those are kind of the, the range of it. So I, and I, at this time in our world, in our society, it's really important to take a, uh, an I minus uh, supplementation. And that will vary. People say, oh, it's dangerous, blah, blah, blah. And it, it doesn't seem to be. There, there's a study of over 4,000 people over four years taking a certain amount, and they, they were fine. They didn't have a problem. But that study also showed about 95% of the American population is deficient in iron. Are people allergic to it? Mostly people, when they talk about am I iodine allergic, it's a protein bind iodine that you usually see when you're doing certain medical tests. They use protein bound iodine. This is not the same thing as freestanding iodine. So, yes, it's essential. It's really important to take. I'm going to be doing a little bit of study to see uh, uh, safety. Um, I take a fair amount of it, and I'm going to really check a few things on myself to see what levels that is and say, because I've been doing it for years. Is there anything you can do to negate the effects of radiation from airplane flying? Yes. And the biggest thing you can do to protect you is take a lot of antioxidants. A full range. So when I'm flying, I'm doing lots of antioxidants uh, on the airplane. That's the simplest way to understand because we're getting lots of free radicals. Uh, there's some other little tricks, but in the simple way, that's the key player. What are the ingredients in the most ideal, most perfect dinner salad that someone could eat? Be specific with the exact sprouts you would use. Well, first of all, I don't really eat dinner. So let's start with the best salad. Uh, in terms of cycles of what we should eat, uh, in terms of Orivetta, we're looking at the best time with the most fire is between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So that's the time I eat. I don't really may have just a juice or a little soup at uh, dinner time, most of the time, 95% of the time. And so, Best time is dinner, best time is at lunch. Uh, in terms of longevity, in terms of well being, and so forth. Because then we can digest it during the day. Now, if you're eating a big dinner at night, you're going to have toxins building up in your system overnight. Okay, we don't want that. That being said, what's the best? Well, there is no best. Uh, that's the cow approach. There's only one diet, there's only one food. It's the same for everybody. I personally use a lots of sprouts and vary it. So I'll use the full range of sprouts, uh, whatever is available, whatever we're growing, whatever I get, just fresh sprouts. And then I use lots of leafy greens. And then I'll put some nuts and seeds in. A person doesn't need a lot of protein, I'll put different nuts and seeds. Uh, and then I don't have a problem with nightshades, so I usually have a tomato, which has a lot of lycopene, which is particularly good for men. So I always like that kind of thing in there. And then different kind of condiments that I, I may use. Uh, but uh, sprouts, tomatoes, and we'll have cucumbers in there, and uh, parsley, uh, and celery are all kind of things I added, and I like oil there, so I'm going to have at least a half avocado that I'm going to add into that. So timing is important, but that's the variation I use, and that's my big meal. I'm not really eating a lot of I'm not, but how do I know that's okay? Because I'm not losing weight. My weight is stable and has been stable for years, and if we think about food as energy, the idea of sprouts is that it gives lots of energy, and all the sprouts are pretty good as long as it's fresh 
sprout. They all have different qualities. My idea is you just keep varying it or having combinations like sunflower sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, you know. Um, our two big players, broccoli sprouts. There, there's a variety of sprouts that are out there. Use all of them. What are our adrenals? What should we do to make sure they stay healthy? Adrenals are a big issue. Most people have adrenal insufficiency, subclinical. They just don't have the energy to be going all day long. Uh, the blood sugars are going up and down. So what controls blood sugar isn't just the pancreas. It's also adrenals. It's also thyroid. It's also hypothalamus. It's also pituitary. And it's, so it's part of a, a larger complex. So I generally see that most people's adrenals are, are not as strong as they need to be. Some are really exhausted. And that's at least 90% of the people I see. So it's a big percentage. So what do we do to build the adrenals? Well, you have to get sufficient sleep, which is about seven hours a day. And between best hours between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. But at least seven hours. And that is very regenerative for endocrine, for immune, and the serotonological nervous system. So I use mostly a lot of uh, herbs to build up the adrenals. And uh, I test in different ways. I test people for Jing, which is your deep life force, and Qi, which is your daily life force, which it affects with the adrenals. And then I also test a kind of adrenal energy, and you know, 100 is optimal. A lot of people are coming in at 30 or 40. So we want to support the adrenals. Adrenals are particularly weakened when you're flying. So uh, particularly when you're flying, we want more adrenal support. And I use a variety of both Chinese and Ayurvedic herbs to achieve that. So uh, we need to give attention, stress, tension, all that weakens the adrenals. So if you're always in fight or flight, it's stressing you out. So the other thing I add when people are weak in adrenals and they're having that anxiety is start meditating. Well, what do we know about meditation is if you've been meditating for five years, regularly, just 20 minutes twice a day. This is a study done by TM. You actually have a physiology that's 15 years younger. That's pretty significant. So we see meditation as a, a, a very powerful rejuvenative, and particularly for people with low adrenal function, that's a really good idea. What's wrong with eating wild fish from deep fishing in cold, unpolluted waters? So, in today's context, and in general, research has now shown that fat from fish is actually toxic to the beta cells of the pancreas. Now, I can't tell you whatever the reasons are. Did that happen? Was that true 100 years ago? I don't know that. I know now. Okay. So I don't recommend eating fish. The second thing is most of the oceans are polluted. As I mentioned before, in the Pacific, all the fish that are caught, all the different types, all have high levels of radiation. So that's a big thing there. And that radiation is polluting fresh water as well because it's coming over in the air. So they're higher in radiation. The higher generally in pollution because uh, fish don't pee. So, wow. They're building up toxins. And as I say, specifically, people who have fish two or three times a week really increase the rate of diabetes. That research has been done both in the US and in Europe. So we have some clear issues with that higher radiation, higher toxins, and fat from fish flesh attacks the beta cells of the pancreas. So, uh, I don't recommend fish for that reason. I used to think it was, you know, beef, chicken, fish. That's the last thing you let go of, you know, becoming vegan. But it doesn't. It's not that. 
Fish is the first thing you want to let go of because of what I just said. Conditions have changed. Are green vegetables and sprouts enough to get all the protein and nutrition we need, or do we need to add beans, whole grains, and nuts to our diet? Again, people vary <clears throat> as to what they need. 10 to 15 percent of protein calorie part is where we want to go. What do we need to achieve that? I'm a slow oxidizer. I can eat the salad with a few nuts and seeds, and I don't need to eat for six hours. A fast oxidizer with well, that is going to need to eat in an hour or two. Okay, so we have different protein needs. I call it the mTOR pathway, but somewhere we should be between 35 and 70 grams. So basically, a slow oxidizer can have half, half as much protein. Again, it's not a lot of protein compared to what meat eaters eat. Okay, so kind of keeping that in mind, I generally recommend nuts and seeds for everybody, but depending who you are, a handful versus a little bit is a, a, a general way of talking about it. Leafy greens also have protein. Spinach is 49% protein, but you're going to eat that much spinach to get a lot of protein. So it's a little deceptive to say, well, the leafy greens are high in protein. They are high in protein, but what you need to eat to get equivalent from a more condensed protein like nuts and seeds is significantly different. You can't eat a bushel of that. Oh, maybe some people, I can't. Also, uh, we have protein concentrates that are really, really good. E3 Live, spirulina, chlorella, they run 60, 70% protein, and they're uh, up to 90, 95% assimilated. So with people who need more protein in the diet, I'll suggest one to two tablespoons three times a day as a way of getting their protein up to where it needs to be. A lot of people are protein deficient, but these are very simple corrections. There's also what I call protein extracts. So there's extra concentrate from pumpkin protein or sunflower seed protein. So there's a lot of things available today. I avoid soy because soy has a variety of problems, plus it's a big allergen, one of the top six allergens, but it also has uh, anti-thyroid factors. And there's a five-year study that I saw that showed people having two helpings of soy a week has significantly more brain cell deterioration over five years. So I don't recommend soy. Lots of reasons, but those are the simple things. Um, the key again is, uh, according to your constitution, you need a little bit or a lot more protein. That's a key thing to get. And Excuse vegans me. are fine. Vegans get enough protein, but again, if you're slow oxidized, like you don't need a lot of supplementation, you know, with age, because uh, being over 65, I had that one tablespoon. Okay, that's it. Other people really needed to have up to two tablespoons three times a day of some sort of protein concentrate. Spirulina or pumpkin seed protein concentrate. There's a lot out there. So those are the ranges. It's really easy for a vegan to get adequate protein. Has seaweed been contaminated by the Fukushima nuclear disaster? or other ocean pollution, do you recommend we consume seaweed? I think the key is yes. Fukushima is seriously contaminated. The research I've read, things like kelp and so forth, are fully radioactive. So for, and I like sea vegetables, I like nori, but I try to get it from the East Coast, the Atlantic, and hopefully that will be sustainable. Uh, North Atlantic is another place. So it's really good to do it, but not from the Pacific Ocean. Should we be eating bee pollen? Or are you concerned about the sugar in it? Bee pollen is very, very rejuvenative. And again, one of the things I've been suggesting throughout the whole interview is you could get very specific concerns, but not see the whole picture. The whole picture of bee pollen is it's very rejuvenative. It has all the amino acids you need. 
It's 15 to 20% protein. Uh, and generally, people do pretty well with it, particularly if you get it from locally grown sources. So I'm not really against bee pollen. Uh, a tablespoon or so a day is doesn't seem to be cause a problem because that sugar isn't significant in the big picture. And if you have diabetes, I don't recommend you take it until you're healed, until you're six months healed. So it's kind of more in what I call phase one and a half. So once you're healed for six months, your blood sugar is stable, you don't have hypoglycemia or diabetes, uh, the amount of sugar you're getting is not significant. Again, we have to be careful of getting so focused on this is dangerous, but we don't see the whole picture. Yeah, it has some sugar, but it has all these other incredible rejuvenative uh, aspects to it. So we have to have a balance. Um, it's a funny story where at the tree we sometimes have a used to have a play, you know, each year, kind of like, and the play with somebody was in the desert. And they were dehydrated. They were basically about to die. And somebody came with a, a, a jug of a liquid. And, okay, they're dehydrated, about to die. You know, the whole act going on. And, 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 they, and the person who's dehydrated, dying of dehydration. So, so what, what's in that? Well, it's apple juice. Oh, it's too sweet. And with that, they die. So it's like having perspective. So bee pollen falls into that. Re you know, if you got hypoglycemia, if you have, uh, you know, diabetes, I wouldn't be recommending it. If you have cancer, I wouldn't be recommending it. But just normal levels of health, it's going to add to your, your well-being a little bit. What are the 10 most important supplements that everyone takes? And what are the next 10 most important after that? Again, we have variations. So I kind of look at supplements in terms of what, what I'm interested in. So I'm interested in brain health. I'm interested in building the mitochondria. I'm interested in antioxidant protection. Because those are, to me, the big er areas. <clears throat> so, and then, of course, you have specific supplements I use for treating the pancreas. So that, that's a different level. So in brain health, uh, and longevity, I'm looking at a variety of uh, mostly Chinese herbs. So I'm going to look at ginseng. I'm going to look at uh, reishi, because they're known for brain health and longevity. I'm going to look at heishu wu. Uh, I'm going to look at goji berries. These are a lot of these are what we call yin jing builders. Really longevity. Those are your top players. And gynostimnia, ashwagandha. Okay. Those, well, I'm going to say those are your, your, your top players. Uh, there's variations. Uh, Brahmi is another one, particularly for brain, memory, and uh, clarity. Uh, those are your big players. Um, that's almost. 10 right there. Then we're going to look at antioxidants and uh, astaxanthine, vitamin C, vitamin E, full range of B vitamins and uh, human active B12. That's different than B12. Human active B12 comes from bacteria that usually grow in animal flesh. There's certain companies that have are now uh, growing back these B12 producing bacteria, and so it, it's really human active B12, so I'm looking at that. But all the B vitamins, we need B1, I mean deficiency in these things, you've got pellagra, you've got all kinds of things. So B1, B2, B3, B6, and uh, folic acid B12. Now, also in terms of mental health, uh, research is clearly shown as an orthomolecular psychiatrist 
that if we're going to treat people with mental imbalances, we need B3, B6, folic acid, and B12, and uh, magnesium as part of the, the supplements that are going to build up your neurotransmitters and so forth. So now we're getting, we just expanded a little bit um, in the big picture. Uh, so we're looking at brain function, we're looking at mitochondria. Now, what I add for mitochondria is the uh, I minus aluminum, which builds the mitochondria, the P CoQ10 PQQ, very good, D ribose, so you're getting mitochondria protection. Okay, so we're talking brain, mitochondria, uh, B vitamins also for the brain, vitamin D, uh, which is both an anti-aging and uh, bone building and cognition, and also for mitochondria, and vitamin K, which goes along with, there's, there's three Gs that work together, uh, A, K, and D, and they all need to be balanced. So we need uh, vitamin K, which makes sure the cal calcium gets deposited in the bones rather than in the tissues. So those are your antioxidants. Uh, picogenol is another important antioxidant. So we probably went over our 20, but the point is, targeting the different things. Now, I'm not talking about specific disease now, right? I'm just talking about maintenance of brain function, maintenance of your immune system. I use a lot of Chinese herbs for the immune. There's a crossover with some of these things. We're talking about longevity, clarity of mind, so and strong antioxidant protection in our world today because all, all the things we're facing, and rebuilding the mitochondria, which are constantly being attacked. So those how, are how I target uh, for myself in, in general the use of supplements. As I, I'm mentioning, it's hard to rate top 10 in a certain way because what are your areas, what are your interests, what do you need? and we're all unique individuals. Now, once we get that in place, I'm happy to do, you know, the 20. And I want to add schizandra, which balances all the meridians. It combines very well with goji berries. It's a very powerful yin-jing combination and is uh, really up there in the top longevity herbs. Now, along with that, we also need to protect our membranes. And uh, both within the mitochondria and the cell membranes, I use phosphatidylserine. Almost everybody needs that. And also the long chain omega 3s, DHA, and EPA. So that kind of rounds it out because you need that. That cuts across all the areas of concern the mitochondria, the cells, uh, <clears throat> brain function for sure and also for diabetes. So those are kind of like the key ones that I tend to use. Yeah, but there, it's more of a holistic approach. Which nutritional supplements are critical for vegans to take? So in that question, what do vegans need? There's an implication that vegans don't get adequate nutrition. It's not really the case. Meat eaters have more uh, deficiencies, particularly in the B vitamin region, except for B12. But it turns out, if we look at B12, maybe 40% of meat eaters need B12, and maybe 80% of vegans need B12 at the lowest level, 200 nanograms. If we're going to go optimum, 450 nanograms, we're probably looking at 80% of meat eaters and 90%. Of vegans. And so B human active B12, that's important, is one of the key nutrients. The omega 3s are a key nutrient. 95% of the population of pregnant women are deficient in DHA. So I look at DHA and EPA as a very key nutrient. What I have also found is that women uh, who get postpartum depression almost invariably have gotten deficient in DHA. Now, how's that? 
because DHA is needed by the baby for brain development and eyesight. So it pulls it out of the mother. They will, my observation, I've seen women 10 years postpartum that are still depressed, and I give them DHA, uh, yellow algae based DHA, and in three to six weeks, the depression's gone after having it for 10 years. So I'm kind of looking at some of the, I'm going to put it key little pieces here as we as we look at. So we have to protect our cell membranes, and uh, and again, uh, phosphatidylserine is part of it. So that's part of really my response to that. But remember, it's individualized. But those are generally the ones we're looking at. How do you prevent type two diabetes and chronic kidney disease? We, we, the how do you predict, pre prevent type two diabetes and chronic liver disease as kidneys? I'm going to separate that a little bit. So when we eat in a way, like I'm going to say phase one point two five diet, which is eighty percent live, one hundred percent vegan, um, and we exercise and we breathe and we meditate, uh, we're going to do a lot of powerful prevention, okay? Then the supplements we mentioned, uh, I'm gonna also mention again, the aluminine, the I- is a critical supplement for brain and for pancreas function. We have to have adequate magnesium uh, in terms of uh, formation of insulin. So, and vitamin C is part of that. All those prevent it. So it's a low sugar diet, low fructose diet, uh, being uh, active exercise wise. Men in particular, not so much with women, need a little bit of increasing the testosterone, which I do with herbs that bring that up. So that's the key. It's, it's primarily diet. And again, a low glycemic diet, 25 to 45%. Uh, plant fat, 25 to 45 percent, uh, high quality plant carbohydrate, leafy greens, sprouts, and, um, and 10 to 15 percent protein, are, uh, and a total lifestyle. Because take sunshine, it's really good for your heart. It's one of the best heart medicines. Take vitamin D, it's very, very good for uh, not just heart function, but for d diabetes. So everything is kind of interwoven. So that's the key, but the lifestyle, and then they, you gotta watch your blood sugar because we change with time, and so it's good to monitor it. I don't like it, the blood sugar to get above 100. Personally, I like to have mine between 70 and 85, which is the optimal range, and there are a lot of other things that go on when you've hit that range. But the point I'm making is uh, living a healthy lifestyle is the best way to prevent it. You don't have your three big players that degenerate the pancreas and the beta cells. There's going to be uh, excess glucose and fructose. One uh, deficiency in the, <clears throat> the long chain omega-3s uh, for the membranes. Those are in, uh, the iodine. So that's a kind of prevention type thing. High amount of animal protein has been shown to uh, actually increase the rate of diabetes. So vegans have uh, 35 to 50 percent less diabetes than meat eaters. That's a very sig significant statistic. Okay, 35 to 50 percent less. It's huge. So we minimize our sugar input to only uh, a natural as it comes with uh, the vegetables and so forth. We cut out the meat, fish, and chicken. And Meat has also been shown, meat fat, like fish fat, has been shown to, to actually been toxic to the beta cells. Not as strong as the fish fat, as, we, as the research shows in Europe and U.S., that we have uh, eating fish two to three times a week is going to increase your rate of type 2 diabetes. So we avoid the meat. Uh, we avoid the glucose and fructose, feed protein, but also animal fat. All three have been shown to activate 
you know, the diabetes type situation. And I'll, I'll just explain a little bit uh, that uh, animal fat in general is toxic, but it also does something else. It tends to block the uh, uh, ability of insulin to get glucose into the cells. So it forces the body to, to create uh, more excess insulin. So we go into insulin resistance in response to an excess of insulin, trying to compensate for the situation. Too much fat in our diet, and we build up fat cells in our body, ends up creating an excess of leptin. Normal leptin is going to say, uh, don't eat too much. That's what, what, what it's going to say. And it's going to burn fat. Uh, when we have excess fat, we go into leptin resistance that will say, eat and add fat. So we really have to keep all that down. And we don't have to think about it so much. We just simply have to live the lifestyle we're talking about. Really, you know, we're looking at fasting twice a year to kind of clear the system of the bile toxins, reestablish a bile flora. Uh, we're, we're looking at some kind of exercises like yoga and uh, tai chi, qigong to kind of build a life force, service and charity to keep the heart open and be connected. We know people live longer when they're connected. Uh, working at some point with uh, spiritual groups, spiritual teachers, support. We know people literally have half the much, half as much depression. And believe it or not, the research shows that people who are depressed, uh, depending on the study, has somewhere between 65 and 82 percent more diabetes uh, once they've had a major depressive episode. So that was done at Kaiser and Johns Hopkins. The research. So. We have all these basic things that go beyond the diet. And then uh, meditating is giving you a 50, uh, physiology. It's 15 years younger. It's been meditating for at least five years. They all are a synergy and uh, awakening spiritual energy. Uh, all those are very, very important in the big picture of nutrition as how we take energy from the world on multiple levels. Why do you feel it was important to come here and speak at the Real Truth About Health conference? I enjoy being at this conference, the Real Truth About Health, not that there's only one truth about health. Uh, we're all unique individuals. We're not a bunch of cows eating grass, so we have different diets, different perspectives. Uh, Long-term holistic health re focuses, disease focuses. And uh, it's good to, to be with people who have been thinking about it. I think Steve does a great job in his organizing, so it's nice to work with him. I like to see old friends like uh, Brian and Marie Clements. Uh, and there's uh, the people who come are very nice and are uh, really ready to, to kind of expand who they are. So it's a great audience. Um, so those are some of the, the things. The other thing is I meet new people who have new insights into what's going on. So it's a way of keeping updated, a way of seeing old friends, a way of sharing it. And uh, it's important for me to get this out to the world uh, as my work is to be the best I can, a light to the world. And that's really the work. In the mornings, I teach the yoga and I also lead... Uh, what we call Shakyapat meditation. So there's a, a overflowing room now of people coming. So all the aspects that are, that interest me are there and it's getting out to the world. Um, so I love getting it out to the world. That's part of my mission, which is more than just the vegan world. It's, it's a holistic liberation viewpoint that I am able to bring to the world obviously based on nutrition and lifestyle that we're talking about. So those are the reasons that I enjoy coming, enjoy speaking, and teaching at different levels.